I actually have heard that you guys know each other, and I'm curious as to when you met or when you started to talk. In the pub. <laughs> 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 which is maybe the most Scottish thing ever but it wasn't a pub um, what, it would have been three years ago two years ago um, through a mutual friend we were at a pub in Los Angeles which is very confusing but um, Shirley was really lovely and came over to the corner of the bar where we were hiding and she was like of course the Scottish people are hiding in the corner drinking what's up <laughs> so, it was a good intro I think <laughs> this is all true yeah have you have you stayed in touch since? Are you are you now buds? Well, I just moved because I was kind of in between different places for a long time. So um, I just moved to Los Angeles, and Shirley had me over to her house for some homemade soup <laughs> a couple of months ago. So I was like, that's not why I would have. I was like, it was really lovely soup as well. So, gee, thanks, Lauren. Yeah, I was like, she's firing <laughs> on all cylinders. If anybody ever wondered, you're like, can Shirley Manson make a kick-ass homemade soup? Yes, that's can. right, damn straight. Um, so there are some obvious similarities about your origin stories. You're both Scottish women who were asked to join bands as the sole female in the band. And then from early critical success, I mean success, excuse me, you really got pushed to the limelight and became the face and the outward facing kind of representative of the band. And I'm wondering in those early days, how did that shift feel to go from something pretty relatively private to being extremely excessively public and also in a kind of marketable way. How did that feel? <laughs> I feel like this is going to be a trend of me being like, do you want to do it? Um, I don't know. I guess for me it was, I'd been in bands before, but I'd mostly been like the side guy in bands. I'd done some singing, but as like a dual vocalist. Mm. Um, and then when I met, Ian from our band, he was recording my previous band. So I knew him through that, but not hugely well. And I didn't know Martin from the band at all. So I don't know, I guess it's just one of those weird things where you can plan it to the ends of the earth. And I always thought that every band I was in was gonna be the one, <laughs> and it was never the one. So I think like it was just, this was just a kind of strange moment of circumstances. So it wasn't even like we had a lot of time to think about any of that stuff. It was just kind of happening and you didn't want to complain about it because you're so lucky to have it. But I think all we did was just try and talk about it as we were moving forward. And I think we were quite conscious at the start of the first record that media, no offense, were trying to do that to us. Like there was a lot of trying to separate me out from it. Right. Half because of front person stuff, half because of gender. Um, and I think that we were quite conscious on the first record of making sure it was established as a band and then now I feel like it's a little bit more comfortable to do like front person stuff because at least that foundation has been set. Whereas I feel like if that's done super early on without your consent, then it's hard to get that back. But you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. Because right. now if I do front person stuff, people are like, well, she's a hypocrite because she said it was a band. But if a male front person did that, nobody would really care. Right. So, I don't know. You're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Yeah. Um, Shirley, what was your experience with that like? Well, I mean, it's much like Lauren's, you know, I'd been in two bands before I sort of got plucked out of obscurity. I'd been a keyboard player and a backing vocalist for a decade. And I was a lot older than Lauren, so I was nearly 30 when I got my sort of break with Garbage. And um, I was pulled aside by our, our press officer at the time, Jim Merlis, who said, you know, just so you know, nobody's going to want to speak to you. They're only going to want to speak to the producer of the band and drummer, Butch Vig, who, for anyone who doesn't know who Butch is, had produced Nevermind by Nirvana. And so, of course, the male uh, journalists, like, journalists were literally creaming themselves, you know. <laughs> so uh, I, I had a very different approach than Lauren. I was like, fuck you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. I, this is right. my job, and I'm going to be good at my job. And... Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, it, it literally was nobody puts baby in the corner, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and I knew that in order for me to survive as a musician in this band, I had to be a great front person. And to be a great front person, you have to be the focal point of your band. That's your job. And sure, some of your bandmates have a little bit of a difficult time jostling and, and, and getting comfortable with that. 
But that's what happens when you make space for yourself, everybody then makes space for their, themselves. And it's painful and awkward sometimes, but ultimately that, that is what has to be done. How do you think that it affected kind of some decision making that you were doing around the time? Lauren, something that you said to me really stuck with me, which is if I, it seems like now, if you didn't write it, you're not gonna sing it. Um, could you expand on that a little bit? Well, I guess I look back on the first record and half of me wants to tell me to like calm down. It's fine, like you're gonna be okay. But then the other half of me is kind of glad that we made a lot of the decisions that we made and we're so kind of cut and dry about it because I don't know, like I didn't know these guys. Now I know that they're really nice, thoughtful, smart guys, but I didn't know them at all at that time. I didn't know our manager who they'd been friends with for a long time. And I don't want to sound paranoid, but I was like, they could all be trying to, they could all be out to get me. I have no idea. So I guess, I don't know. Remember we had a meeting in a pub talking about maybe making it a real band. Um, and then when I asked to be like, can we write things equally and can I be cut in equally? The guys were like, absolutely, of course. And I think back on that, I'm like, if I hadn't done that, I don't think I would be very comfortable with it. Like at this point, we know that the band is equal three parts, but a lot of the, a lot of it falls on the front person just by the nature of the thing. Sure. So if I wasn't happy with what we were putting out or confident in what I was saying in the songs and otherwise, I don't think I would be able to support it or defend it in the same way. Like it kind of, ha you have to believe it because it's coming out of your mouth and you're going to have to answer for it. So that's why I tussled. It was a very short tussle. It was literally like one sentence and they were like, sure. But it felt like in my mind, I was like, <laughs> I'm going to have to grapple for this. And then they were like, absolutely, of course. I'm like, oh. So. And, yeah. and I think, I think um, to that point, you know, as you both had extremely successful early albums and as you mature and evolve as an artist, as you grow older, what are the pressures that come both with your narrative and what you represent and how you work as an artist and what the industry asks of you for that matter well the industry asks for more always mm -hmm. you know and you don't really know that at first because you're so dazzled with your own success in a in a funny way you know i came out of bands that i'd been in for a decade and not sold one single record really and then all of a sudden we were selling multi-million copies of anything that we put out and you're dazzled by that you know and confused by it and it feels enormous until the record label starts telling you you know yeah you sold four million of of this record next time we want you to sell eight million and you're like what i mean it's insanity right mm. And so you're constantly feeling like you're just running, 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 and you're being chased by dogs, and nothing you do is enough, ever. I mean, and it's still like that, it remains that way throughout my entire career. Nothing that you do is ever enough, and people want more and expect more, and, uh, and you're judged by how much you, know, you, you, you are able to produce, and uh, it gets, it's nuts. Yeah. It's, an, it's a crazy industry based on greed and insanity. And we're all That's active. the cool quote right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, to that point, how do you maintain perspective? How do you keep your work and your creative space precious, knowing that you have to produce so much more? I, I, I didn't keep it precious. <laughs> I mean, I spread my legs and, you know, got royally fucked over and over and over again until I got to an age where I thought to myself, if I don't stop this, I'm going to lose my mind. And I was very lucky. I came, Laura and I both come from a very small island where there's a, a, a and stop me if you disagree, but you know, that we have a, a really strong sense of community in, in, in Scotland. And uh, there's certain sort of fundamentals that you're taught from a kid, you know, that I think have helped me negotiate the record industry. Um, one is, is authenticity. You know, in Scotland, you cannot come home from being on top of the pops or the Grammys and act like you're something else. You have to be yourself. Otherwise, you literally get made of fun of loudly in pubs and, and yes. <laughs> sometimes walking down the street. So you have to be real. And that authenticity and being myself and being my old smelly real self 
helped me stay sane because I wasn't putting on airs and graces that I then had to put back on as like a costume every day. I could just be myself and walk through my career and I didn't lose my mind. And neither has Lauren, I notice. I noticed that one, one of the first things I noticed about her when I met her was she was real. You know, she's not poncing around with a fake American accent and... Yet. Yet. <laughs> I just got to Los Angeles, like, give me a minute. I can't even drive on the right side of the street yet, so I haven't had time to fake the accent. But, <laughs> but I don't, I think that's something I definitely felt watching you, like when I was playing in bands before, was there were so many things that I enjoyed and felt really inspired by, but when you see people in interviews and they're talking, it doesn't feel real or it doesn't feel like that person in interviews matches up with the person you see right. in they're they're separate in a way and I always like that it just kind of and I think that's really inspiring to young girls like when I was younger and like watching you I was like I, be I believed it I told and then it's because it, it's real and now from the other side of it I feel like if so much of what we do is performance but if I had to get up every day and perform as something that didn't feel honest to me, then I think, I, as you say, I'm like, I don't, I think it would have, I would have either stopped doing it or it would have, I would have had to change the way I was doing it and just kind of turn my brain off and robot through everything, I think. I think that um, that kind of brings me to something that I wanted to discuss, which is, unfortunately, the internet. Um, you know, Shirley, you've been doing this for over 25 years. You've seen the way that the internet and also immediate access to your fans and to your critics via social media can really inform a lot of emotional and career-oriented paths. So I'm wondering, do you think that the rise of social media has helped women have control over their narrative or has it been more harmful? I think, like anything, it's a double-edged sword. You know, I, I definitely think it has its drawbacks, and we've certainly seen a lot of, of uh, artists, celebrities, whatnot, like really like hang themselves a little out in yeah. public. But in general, I think it's been a remarkable tool um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, most, of, most importantly, I think social media is a great galvanizer. So it's a great galvanizer of ideas. And for women, currently, that's been phenomenal. And so ultimately, I'm very grateful to social media, although I'm also aware of how horrendous it can be, you know. But I see it as a way of me and my band having a little newspaper. Mm -hmm. You know, we have our own paper. We have our own, um, you know, press sort of a, a way of, of reaching our story to directly to the people that we want to get it to without interference. And I think that's pretty marvelous. I know that your experience, though, has been a little more complicated than mine. Well, I feel like it's been half and half. Um, but also I wonder if it's like the nature of the kind of band we were in as well, because... Mm. What do you mean by that? Um, I think maybe now, because people know what churches is a little more, it makes more sense to people. But I think at the start they were like, this band looks like this, they sound like this, it's a pop band. And there was different expectations right. put on it than when I was in more alternative bands. And it was obviously much bigger than that. but. I like the way, your way of looking at it, that it does kind of feel like, not a right to reply, but just a right to take part in your own narrative. Because even if you do an interview, that's still going through someone else's filter. They're choosing what quotes from you were relevant to them, and they're going to stitch it, sorry, <laughs> put it together. <laughs> put it you don't together need to apologize way that to makes, me. <laughs> you know, I like that every time I say, I'm like, not you, not, not you. Um, not all but, journalists. <laughs> hashtag not all journalists. But... Um, I, yeah, and I kind of feel like it's been a good way for us to get across the personality of a band that didn't have to come through a filter of somebody else's opinion. So I think that's been really positive. And it has been the way that I met most other women in bands that I talked to because there weren't any really very many other women in bands when I was growing up. And then even when our bands gotten bigger, it's still difficult to meet people because there isn't that much going on, especially when we started the festival lineups the first year we played it was literally like floating in a sea of penis. And that's awful. <laughs> that's so horrible. And How it, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Bumping up against, anyway. Um, but, and I think, yeah, I remember like following, us following each other on the internet. We were sneakily liking some things and um, we did a collaboration with Haley from Paramore and we met her on the internet, which sounds creepy, but it's not, because it can be a good thing. It's and a it wee just, bit creepy. Yeah, it's a little creepy. And then I was just waiting, waiting for her to follow <laughs> back. Um, 
But uh, yeah, I kind of feel like you can, it can be a positive thing, but I've had, had to kind of reframe how I look at it and how I use it. Well, I did want to ask about that. Um, you wrote an essay for The Guardian right when Churches was kicking off, which I think was really prescient. It was before the conversation around misogyny online had hit critical mass, which has happened in more recent years. And I'm wondering if you've modified the way that you use social media and also are you reading reviews? Are you engaging with critics online? I did once. I did once, and then the next day I was like, I don't know if you should have done that. But, uh, well, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I, I try and prime, this is just funny. I think this is kind of funny when people talk about our band, they either talk about it as like, she's a cute little bunny rabbit who's very, that's nice, or they're like, she's a cold, angry bitch. So I'm like, I don't know if either of those are true, but, um, I didn't help myself that much that day. But I think it was because I don't really ever read about the band. And I read this one because I'd heard people talking about it. And then I looked at it. And ultimately, right, you, can rev you should be able to review a record however you want. And I guess in this time of celebrity culture, to an extent, you are reviewing that person. But in this particular review, it really felt like he wasn't, he doesn't know me from Eve, Adam. Um, but it wasn't like he was reviewing the record or even reviewing me. He was reviewing what he believed I stand for and then put protests in inverted commas. And I was like, that's like that to me goes beyond the purview of what your review is. I'm like, you're reviewing what you believe to be like protest culture. And I kind of think that's bullshit because you get to sit in your sit in your apartment on your computer writing away. But these things aren't affecting you. And if you don't like the record, or you don't like me. That's fine. But don't then like side-eye a whole movement because you think I'm an idiot, but. Have, did you guys see the, the Mitski mac DeMarco conversation? Oh, yes, about the titles. So yeah, that was to, very to debrief very quickly, Mac DeMarco, um, charming to some indie man, released an album by the same, or a similar name as Mitski, which was critically lauded last year, Be the Cowboy. Um, and then the first single of the album was also this, by the same name as her first single for oh, that cool. album. And the internet noticed very quickly, and her fans came to her defense rapidly. She herself made a joke about it. She said that this is humorous, and I'd like to not be involved <laughs> in any further discourse about this, but like, this is funny, thank you to my fans, and that's the end of it her fans kept on and it i th and she she later said something about it being pretty overwhelming and just thank you and let let this be so my question for you is do you feel like you have any sort of responsibility to engage with your fans or do you feel like you need to monitor or moderate your fans in any way being such vocal women about so many issues absolutely not no I don't think it's my job and I certainly, if I want to engage with somebody, I'll engage with somebody. I don't feel a responsibility to do that. Um, I enjoy engaging with the fans a lot. And again, that's a part of social media that I love because as an artist, I'm looking for connection. I, w I want to connect with pe other human beings, you know, um, but I certainly don't feel any duty to do so. And for the most part, I have learned, thanks to my father, um, to remove myself from what people are saying about me, whether it's in the press, whether it's between fans. I had a very, you know, I had a really unpleasant experience round about Lauren's age, actually, um, about 20 years ago. Um, I read in the press that I was looking fat. And uh, I was in America and I'd called home and I was cr on the phone and I, my dad came on the phone and I burst out crying and I was like, they're saying I'm fat. They're saying I've eaten too many Twinkies, right? And I, I was genuinely shaken by this, you know, mm -hmm. it just made me feel really bad about myself. And my dad was like, you have got to stop going on the internet and looking for affirmation. You have to stop it. Because what you're going to do is you'll get a little bit of affirmation and then you'll get a lot of negativity. Right. You have to stop it right now. And that's when I basically pulled myself out and it saved my sanity. You know, when we talk about mental health in the music yeah. industry, that's number one tip right there. Stop. Yeah, you're never going to Google and find enough good stuff. If you Google, if you you only Google if you already feel like shit. Yeah, and artists, <laughs> genu genu generally speaking, 
they, they, the artist has a hole inside them anyway. It's the hole that makes you want to create because you don't feel enough. So you create in order to try and feel whole. And so I think artists are very much vulnerable to other people's opinions and ideas and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I, I think it's best, best not to Google. Not to do that. Well, and I guess for us, like, we were so active on the internet when the band started, and we still try and do that to an extent, but I think we just had to reframe the way that we were using it because right. I don't use social media in the same personal way that a lot of people will because it's just not the nature of my life. I'm lucky to have what I have, but I just can't do that. And I think, you know... I'm not a message board moderator. Like right. we really, yeah. really appreciate how much love people put into the band, but and I think about I'm conscious of what I say because I know that it is heard by more than just like my friend in the pub. But I'm like it's not healthy to be on the internet wading through the comments like helping people out and you know? Right. I'm like I'm not doing it out of badness because I hate them. It's just that like, I'm like, man, if I sat on the internet all day like trying to moderate and do all that, I don't I don't really, is that part of the job requirement? I can't tell. And it's not good for your brain to be in there because then you see all kinds of stuff you don't need to see. Yeah. So, anyway. Um, to bring it to something personal, you both have done the extremely difficult thing of speaking about being the victim of sexual assault, emotional or physical abuse. It is something that is hitting a head right now in the music industry as a whole. And I'm wondering, what compelled you to share those stories? Well, I haven't been the victim of sexual assault, to be fair. And so I, have, I haven't ever had to speak out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been physically assaulted, but n not in any major way. Um, it certainly affected me, but not in the way of so many of my colleagues and, and my peers. So I don't feel like I'm an educator. I, I should be even. I think this even question. speaking out about abuse and kind of the emotional toll that that takes is now more commonplace than it once was. And I'm just curious as, as to you know your thoughts about speaking up about that. Well, I guess for me it was for a website newsletter called Lanny, which was run by women, and they'd asked me to write something, anything. They were like, choose anything you want to write about. And I was like, oh, that's vague. <laughs> and I think I suggested a few ideas and we didn't quite feel like they fitted. And um, yeah, I don't know. When I wrote about it, I was like, well, this is a newsletter for women. What would connect with other women? Or what's, what's a story that you can tell in this space that's actually safe? You're not handing it to a publication that maybe wouldn't handle it as, as well. Um, and I feel like the amount of people that have spoken to us about that, and I view myself as one of the very privileged, very lucky people that how much I've been affected by something like that is this much compared to so many women yeah. I know. So I think you have to, we have to be responsible when we talk about it. But I don't know. Even the conversation around that feels different now than it did in 2015 or whenever we wrote that. And I think that's what's been interesting about me too is I don't know any women that were surprised by any of this, really. I know a lot of good, smart men that were surprised by it, or surprised by the extent of it, at least. So, I don't know. I don't know if the world has changed in the course of two years, but... No, but I do have to give a big shout out to Tarana Burke for being the one who started the Me Too movement and allowed so many women to come forward. It gave everyone's permission to come forward with their stories. And uh, I feel very strongly that the Me Too movement was a moment for so many women who were bursting at the seams to, to talk about this and to, to bring this topic into the public consciousness. And it's something we all, as a, an entire community, as an entire society, as a globe, have to continue to build upon. We cannot afford to let the Me Too movement fall by the wayside, we can't allow it to have been the topic of conversation a year ago. It is something that's really serious, speaks volumes of the kind of society we continue to build over and over again. We've got this peculiar status quo that we have not yet smashed that is, is allowing one in three women to be a victim of either domestic or sexual assault. Now that is insane in this day and age that this is going on. And as Lauren so rightfully said, you know, so many good men were shocked and continue to be shocked at these statistics. Not one woman I know, same right. thing, was shocked. 
Not one. Do you feel like, I feel personally like this came late to music um, comparatively to the other entertainment industries. I know a lot of my peers in music feel the same way, possibly because music doesn't operate as a traditional workplace. But do you feel like it was late to music and why do you think so? I guess, yeah, it kind of felt like at the beginning of this conversation there was maybe a couple of sacrificial lambs and then there was quite a few people discreetly shooed out the back door and there was no discussion about it. Mm. But it doesn't feel like there's been the same, maybe because music's not unionized in the same way or I was reading Laura Snape's article about, I don't know if I'm allowed to say the name. Yeah, say Ryan the name. Adams. And uh, what she was saying that like so much of music is focused around night time and gig club culture so it's, it, maybe it was easier for people to say it was a great area because of the nature of the work um, but I certainly don't feel like that and even in the tiny microcosm of the music community that I come from I'm like there's definitely people that I can name and you can have a conversation with people from like people from home about it and they know like everybody knows xyz guy is like that but there's been no consequences for people like that in that space so the trickle down effect hasn't yeah. Definitely hasn't happened on a local level, I don't think. And the, go ahead. <coughs> no, carry on. I was just going to say this, this web of complicity where it takes a village to keep a secret. Just well, yeah. It's not like way. one guy did one thing once. Right. And it was an isolated incident. Like, there's always structures put in place to keep these things going. And when you look at high-profile abusers in the music industry, those people were kept there because they were making people money. Those people were kept on radio playlists because they were making people money. Mm. And, and it's I, still like that. Yeah. yeah. And I think I remember like a couple of years ago making a sarcastic comment to somebody in a radio station about them still playlisting Chris Brown. And they were like, but people really... And I understand that there's layers to that conversation, but... At that point, I'm like, somebody has shown you over and over and over again who they are, but you don't want to believe them because they're still making you money. And if you take him off your playlist, then you're going to upset some people. So then you're jeopardizing your business model. So it's better for everyone just to keep things the way they are. And I don't think it is better. But until somebody has to put themselves on the line to change that, and it's hard to know who, what person at what part of the business structure is going to do it. Well, it's also terrifying, though, when you read that after the the showings of the latest Michael Jackson documentary, uh, R. Kelly's, um, these, the, these outrageous stories of abuse um, that have come to the public consciousness and their record sales are, are, are spiraling, you know, faster than ever before. Now, what does that say, again, about the culture we're living in? There's a, there's a peculiar, like, um, like, disconnect going on where, I mean, people are, aware that there's child abuse occurring and say nothing and do nothing. I mean, what, what, has, what has happened here in our world that we, have, and, and I think it's like what Lauren says, it's a lot to do with money. Money has become the god of the globe and humanity is literally becoming worthless. Human beings are being told they're worthless, therefore they feel worthless and therefore they don't pull themselves up to be, you know, the best sort of, version of themselves they can be. I mean, it's such a long story and it's certainly way beyond this panel in South by Southwest. But we can fix it right now. But <laughs> it's Let's just thought. do it. Is there, is there anything that you think needs to be radically changed within the industry at a corporate, like at a label level, at a radio level, to that would make the impact to show that the music industry is behind well, this is just a microcosm, again, of society. Right. I mean, the music industry is just a, one version of an, a, you know, a systemic issue. And uh, things need to change. And I think it starts with how we educate our children. I think it's just, it, it has to do with gender bias. Like, we need to, you know, I love the, the sort of uh, arrival, if you will, of <clears throat> language surrounding gender, you know, the binary gender system that mm -hmm. I was immersed in when I was growing up. You know, I love that that's all getting smashed and broken down because I think that changes the way we educate our children. We, we have to change the way we're looking at gender, the way that we're looking at what is acceptable within people's behaviors and we have to examine our sexualities and uh, our identities. I mean, it's just so messed up and so 
necessary and vital that we start examining that. And, and I think governments really have to be serious about putting money into spending time trying to figure out who we are, what we are, what we need, so that, that men are not marauding the streets, pouncing on women, or, or you know, grabbing them in the workplace, or battering them at home. I think one of the, the more heartbreaking things about these stories, like with Phoebe Bridges and Mandy Moore and Ryan, in Ryan Adams' case, um, with some of R. Kelly's victims, is that these were women looking for mentorship. They were aspiring musicians who were looking for a role model, ultim and ultimately that was taken advantage of. I know that you have both worked with mentorship, you're working with girls' school. Um, what do you find that young women want to know about or are eager to ask about from mentoring your experiences? Well, this is a bit of a controversial comment, I guess. Nothing. <laughs> I don't have women ask me questions. I watch them ask my male counterparts. Oh, really? And that is a pretty bold statement, but I have noticed for now, I've been in the music industry for 35 years. I've never really been asked for advice per se. Mm. And I just was reading uh, an incredible Bell Hooks book that was talking about how the major narratives about love are written by men and that women have, have not yet really been They've either been ex excluded from the narrative or uh, they have yet to become part of the narrative, but that she throws out this theory that women believe that they are already, they know about the female experience, they aren't really interested in hearing about the female experience, they want to know about the male experience. And I'm always sort of watching this dynamic go down where I see young girls who have the opportunity to pick my brains and I know they are the, I am their greatest ally in that room but they just naturally gravitate to the men in the room because they have been taught that the patriarchy is powerful. And if they want to do anything in life, they have to learn how to ascend that ladder. And so they're just uninterested, you know? And yet I feel like it, I have, I, I want to protect them, I want to help them, I know I can, but I can't interject myself into that. I don't know if that's been your experience, but that's been- Surely you can be my mentor. <laughs> okay, cool, I'll be yours. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I guess we've only we did stuff with Girls Rock Camp on this album, and then most of the time the girls are like mm -hmm. ten, twelve. So turns out I'm really cool to like ten, twelve year old girls. <laughs> um, I like I want to be like C, C <laughs> to all the grown ups, but they don't care. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I guess maybe they're too young to kind of fully have understood that and got to that place yet. But I don't know. I also feel like I want to be positive and like make it a happy experience when they come to a sound check or come to something else. But like ultimately the advice that I would give is probably not that cheerful. It would be like, you need to be better. You need to be, you need to be twice as good and twice as fast and twice as hard as everybody else. You need to, you need to do that. Otherwise you're going to get swept away with the tide and someone's going to take it away from you. But that feels like a really hardcore thing to say to a 10 year old. But that's the reality. Yeah. You know, well, and I do think that sometimes I'm like, not that I'm saying I'm twice as good as my male peers. I don't feel like that, but it was my dad. Good advice from the dads here. That I remember once talking about an internship in a job I'd had previously, and I was like, but I'm in the room, and I'm getting all the stuff, and I didn't go to Oxbridge, and I didn't go to Durham University, and I just don't understand why. And he was like, yeah, but you're not pushing yourself in enough. And he was like, ultimately, you could, pie paraphrase, but he was like, you could complain about it, and he was like, or you can know that you just have to work extra hard to get half, this, half the reward. And I was like, that's really harsh. But I can think I've kind of tried to think about that when we've been doing these things. And it, it isn't fair that that's what women have to do for an equal or equivalent level of success. But I think that it is the way that it is. It has to be so undeniable that they'll let you have it. So yeah. I'm just making 10 year olds cry across, <laughs> that's my girl. across the globe. I'm like, you can eat sweets later. We're going to figure this out first. <laughs> um, uh, going back to what, what you said about about women asking the men in the room. It feels, correct me if I'm wrong, that to be an extremely successful female mus musician, you have to know how to navigate the egos of many men. Um, with this call to action across the industry, within the festivals, as we were talking about with Key Change earlier, how do you weigh your business interests with your 
belief that things need to be fair and you need to be representative in a fair playing field? That's a really interesting question. I, I, I mean, f you know, I am older, so I'm 52 years old, right? And only now am I beginning to understand, you know, in the context of a patriarchal system, I also have white privilege, you know, as a white female, I have extraordinary privilege. I'm only just learning this now, and I'm so deeply ashamed of my own ignorance, you know, but we come from a monoculture, you know, so coming to America was a big lesson for me, and, and I've had to learn really fast, but it calls into question on my sudden awareness of what it means to be a black woman, a, a, an indigenous woman, a woman of color, a trans woman, a disabled woman. Um, and I, I've suddenly come to realize, wow, you know, it, I've had a lot of these, what I, I consider, you know, obstacles in my career. And now I'm even more aware of how difficult it is for these women that I just mentioned. So as I'm becoming more and more aware that I want to be someone who passes the mic to these women. I want to be the one who stands up and fights with them. I, sudden, I suddenly became aware that the white feminist movement had done fuck all for women of color and black women and ind indigenous women. I didn't understand that. I didn't understand what it meant to align myself with feminism until very recently, you know, and so it's really been a learning curve for me. Um, but I realized that, you know, to ask a really young person, like say, I don't know if there's any musicians, female musicians in the room here, but are, yeah. So, you know, you're, you're hungry and you want to do well and, you, and you're ambitious and you should be, and you should be looking after yourself. And it's up to people like me who've had an incredibly privileged career to really start considering how you weigh, how I weigh my business decisions, how I weigh my duty to other women and you know as I've gotten older I've become really passionate about it I want to make things better for the women who are coming up behind me mm. things were difficult for me you know um, and I consider my generation we've made things easier for Lauren's generation and Lauren will in turn make it easier for those who come up behind her but I think it's absolutely vital and and uh, that we make space or, 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 or start in really forcing the doors open for female musicians, of, of black female musicians, colored, you know, so on and so forth, indigenous women. We have to make this a priority. It's, a, it's imperative because until we look after the marginalized voices who are, who are you know, even more marginalized than, than us, we're never going to get anywhere. We're never going to change the system. We're never going to smash the status quo. And it's, this is up to us, each and every one of us. How do we change this horrendous situation we all find ourselves in, you know? Well, um, I guess it's interesting that around the conversation of like festival lineups, every summer people always ask us the festival lineups conversation. Ugh. And I like it when people use churches as an example of, no, we got one. We've got one. <laughs> and like, but in this moment, I don't really know that you get a prize for booking like a straight middle class white woman. I don't think you get a prize for that. And ultimately, like, not to sound big headed, but like they don't book us because they're trying to further my career. They book us because we're lucky enough at this point to have good tickets. So we fill, we tick the boxes that they need regardless of gender, and then there's a little cherry on top, a little vagina-shaped cherry, that now they can, <laughs> well, they can use that to cover their own backs. And I understand the argument that there isn't, you know, there's huge pop female headliners and there's good alternative rock headliners, but they need to worry about their ticket sales. But then bottom load, like, bottom load your stages with, with much more diversity then, and then maybe in five years, 10 years, it'll be different. But I just kind of think that centering that conversation around straight white women is, is done. Like, I don't think that that's actually doing anything useful. Hear, hear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, in, a, in a mainstream light, the Grammys this year try to actively combat their history of all the rubbish stuff they've done before. <laughs> yeah. Tried to actively combat Sorry. a decade of never going to get one decade now. more of being yeah yeah. Surely you've been nominated seven times, I think. <laughs> how a bunch. Do you, how do you how do you feel about the way that they handled Neil Portnow 
and the issue of inclusivity, inclusivity this year? Well, first of all, I was happy to see that there were more women on the bill. That's great, right? I mean, yeah. you know, that's wonderful. Was it tokenism? Maybe we'll have to wait until next year to see whether it was tokenism or not. Uh, nevertheless, I'm glad to see more talent and, and more diversity on the bill. That was great. The, the thing with Neil Portnow, which continues to infuriate me, is last time I checked, which was a week before the Grammys, he was still in place. He was still in his job. Uh, I went to hear Dolly Parton speak, and he was the person who introduced oh. her. And I was sitting my fit I, to be oh, tied. You know, as my yeah. husband said, don't make a scene, don't make a scene. <laughs> Pushing um, Dolly out the way like, just a second. You did you canyed her to talk to him. He should have been kicked out the day after these outrageous comments came out of his mouth. I was so offended. I think every woman artist in the world was offended by what he had to say. How dare he speak like that? And he is still he was like I said, he's he was allowed to walk away from the job. He chose to leave. He wasn't fired. That man should have been fired for outrageous, sexist, misogynistic comments made on a global stage. Mm. It's, it's shameful. And that's how I feel about Neil Portnow <laughs> and how the Grammys handled that situation. Well, and like we were talking once, maybe over the soup, about the sense that... We talked about so many things. Over the <laughs> well, soup. I was, we had wine and... <laughs> so it's not like, you know, there was layers. But... We were talking during that about how, I don't know, I found it really reassuring when I started meeting women like Shirley who wanted to make space for other women. Because when I was growing up, it was very much like, there's only space for one of you. Right. If you're lucky enough to get in, like then you're the one. And you need to like kill everybody else and don't make any <laughs> space. Because you, know, you get to be the They're token when you can get in. And I think comments like what he made was that you know women need to step up and push themselves forward. That encourages women to pits them against each other to try and get in the space and that was just I'm like that just showed I was like you're old and out of touch I know that's not a nice thing to say but you know I was like women are stepping up like so many people are stepping up but if you're everything in the industry is set up and run by people that look and think like you then I can step up all I want every day, but I'll be banging my head against the wall so I don't watch so many young female artists bust a fucking gut to work in the music industry, right. to make music, to they're in transit vans for 15 hours, you know, to go and play a shitty show, playing. But if in front they just of three tried people. harder, yeah, <laughs> I, and you know, and they're holding down two jobs. Exactly, yeah. it makes me crazy that somebody has the indecency to say something like that to young talents that are are, are literally working two jobs and 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 have been doing so for years and years and years. It infuriates me, and it's so disrespectful. I deeply agree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have some. I'm getting fired up. Can you feel it? <laughs> <laughs> we have some questions from the audience and viewers at home. So I'm going to share them from Jenny Penny. Lauren, what do you most admire about Shirley and vice versa? <laughs> and there's emojis. There's one of those. And there's like a heart one. Can you guys see Let's it? Let's not discuss emojis. Oh. We had, an, we had an emoji situation this morning. <laughs> no, I, <didn't. laughs> I was quite tired. I don't know. And then we were texting about it. And then I put like one of those like shooting stars. And then it was just stuff. And then a like gust of wind. And I was like, okay, so are you the shooting star and I'm the old fart? <laughs> there was no response to that text. <laughs> I meant it to like visually sum up how, because we were talking about how we can play gigs and stuff, but we're not like, ooh, talking is scary. So I was like, oh, shooting star, fart. Uh -huh. Keep what. digging, keep digging. <laughs> Just tell, tell her what, some nice things about me. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, no. Uh, um, well, I think one of the first times I saw you play live, I think I just loved that. It just kind of turned on its head what I thought about female performers, and I hate the preface of that, but I was like a teenager, so it, to me, I was like, well, this is a female performer, so they would perform in this way. And I don't know, I always really admire that the way you perform is so powerful and it's so intrinsically feminine, but it's so intrinsically not about that all at the same time. And Thanks, Lauren. You know what I mean? I and what like, I, I like about that. Lauren <laughs> is I'm very proud that she comes from my country, and I think she's conducted herself beautifully in the public eye. Apart from that one time. Except for that one time, but we'll leave that. Um, but has, has brought intelligence to her, to her work, and she, I can tell that she takes it very seriously and works really hard. I know she's very disciplined, and it's not easy being in a band with, 
with a bunch of dudes that you've never really known from Adam before you've joined them. So I know what I know because of what I went through, what she's gone through. So I respect that enormously. Plus, she makes great records. Yay! Yay! Aww. Oh, it's feel good, isn't it? Isn't that very wholesome? <laughs> um, uh, from an anonymous person, what do you think about separating art from the artist? Should we, just one example is listening to R. Kelly's music after we've learned about his horrible acts. Interesting question. Um, I feel like I've had so many conversations with friends about it that I know that I'm quite hardline about that. Maybe because for me as a, part, like as a writer, I know that I'm writing about things I believe in and it's all kind of connected in the music and outside of the music. So maybe that makes it harder for me to think I mean, if somebody's doing those things that are morally abhorrent, I don't think I can put on their record and like empathize with what they're saying about other things. And I understand that there's many layers to the R. Kelly conversation, that he was a really important figure for a lot of people and he was a huge superstar and a person of color and that the music is like part of those people's lives now to an extent. It's not his, it's his music, but it means something to them emotionally. But at the end of the day, I'm like, but you are supporting that person. You're putting your money into that. And I just, I can't do that. So for me, that means that the Woody Allens and Roman Polanskis and all these guys, they need to. And I think in a way it just feels selfish to me because I'm like, oh, well, my enjoyment of this art is more important than the person that's making it. And I don't know. I don't think that's fair. Yeah, I mean, I, m I must admit, if I find out that somebody is a child molester, it's Cheeky. gut churning. Yeah. And I just never, ever want to listen to that person again, ever. Um, but then you have somebody like a Frank Sinatra. I'm a big Frank Sinatra fan, but there's a lot of stories about Frank that aren't too beautiful yeah. either. Right. Um, so I don't know whether uh, you become so distanced from a figure, you know, like Frank Sinatra feels like he comes from another, you know, time, where it feels, I don't know, I don't know enough about him or his life. All I know is, in, in, if I know that somebody is a child molester or a wife beater or a rapist, I don't want anything to do with them or their music ever again. But I understand just looking at the figures that I was talking about with right. the rise of Michael Jackson sales and R. Kelly sales this week, that a lot of people just don't draw that line. And that's, that's for them to live with. You know, ultimately, I just think if you don't care about that kind of thing, you can listen to all the R. Kelly records you want. You're going to have a miserable, shitty life. Fair. Well, a friend of mine was like, maybe there's a way to put... And then I was like, nah, I can't see companies signing off on that. But put a disclaimer at the start of the song. So like, at the beginning of the song, you're like, just so you know, this next artist <laughs> <laughs> has been convicted of X, Y, and Z. And then you're like, but if you want to carry on, then... And then it's okay, because for the alleged ones, where it's like, he said, she said, you could be like, this person allegedly, and still tell them, and then they have to choose. If you already get the adverts on Spotify and stuff, it'd just be like a really responsible yeah. advert. The disclaimer is as long as the song. You know? Yeah. Um, from Steph, as a woman, I understand the feeling of having to work harder for half the reward. How do you push through that without letting the pressure get in your way? I think it depends on the day. Like some days I'll be having a shower and I'll be like, this is so unfair! And then I remember that I'm really lucky, so I'm, I'm fine. But um, I don't know, I guess like you can sit and think about it. And whenever people ask us the, what's it like to be a woman in a band question? I'm like, well, I'm never gonna know any different than that. So I could sit and think about it all day and then unpack the nuances of it. But ultimately that's, that's the ball I have to run with. So I'm like, I don't wanna sit and, Think about it, it just is the way that it is. So you can kind of work with the tools that you have and then try and, you know, I might only get to be here for five minutes, so I wanna do something that feels valid and feels like it'll be useful to somebody else so that I can sleep at night and then maybe in two years, 10 years, 20 years, like you make tiny changes to the little bit of earth that you get to pick at, I guess. I mean, when I was younger, I didn't always see the sexism at play. I didn't always, notice it because I was so busy hustling and so otherwise engaged and, and again as you as I've gotten older I've got more space I'm sort of I feel like I'm more like I used to be the hamster on the wheel and now I feel a bit more like the scientist watching the hamster on the wheel with regards to my own life with regards to how I move through a, a sexist society you know and if and when I do meet sexism I just put my shoulder to the wall and push 
and I'm relentless. And I no longer rely on what I, like back in the day, used to use humor a lot. Or, or I used, you know, cuteness, you know. Mm. Now I'm just like, no, that's not cool. And here's why it's not cool. And then when you call it out and, sh and, and you leave space for it to be seen, generally speaking, it dismantles it and you can move forward. Is there any room to be tired? Yeah. Weekly, <laughs> daily. It is tiring, you know, but it's also a challenge. And it's exciting, like Lauren says, we're so lucky. We've got fantastic jobs, you know, and right. boo-hoo that we've got a little bit of, of contentious issues to push through. Pushing, pushing is good. Struggle is good, you know. I think, um, at least I for one, like I said earlier, I just want things better for my niece. I want her generation to have it a little easier than me. You know, that's what I want. And, and that's why I'm here. That's why I speak on these things. Not for myself. I really couldn't give a toss. I can deal with any man that's stuck in front of me. Anyone. We'll be, we'll be, I will be comparing fights in the hallway after this, if anybody wants to. I can deal with it. I don't feel intimidated by it. Maybe when I was younger I did, but I don't anymore. Um, from Doghouse, <laughs> Shirley and Lauren, which women have influenced you, musically or otherwise? Ooh. Absent the people on the stage. Oh, yeah, you remind me. Oh, yeah. um, um, well, I think when I, in the house I grew up in, my parents weren't musicians, but they played us so much music. Um, and my mum was a huge, huge Whitney Houston fan. Um, so I was, <laughs> apparently when I was like seven, I wrote for school, they were like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I either wanted to work in WH Smith, which is a stationery store, <laughs> or I wanted to be the person that got Whitney Houston's messages for her, which is like going and getting her groceries and stuff. Wow. <laughs> so I was like so convinced, I was like, Whitney just needs me. <laughs> and I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to go and get her some oranges and just some stuff she needs. Um, so her assistant. Yeah, basically, I was like, I wanted to be a PA when I was seven. I was like, well, it's a bit weird. Um, you know, other kids were like, I want to be an astronaut. And I was like, I want to go get cereal for Whitney. <laughs> but, but yeah, I don't know. And then obviously that story is really a lot darker and a lot more sad in hindsight. But I just remember being so, like, mesmerized by her voice. Yeah. And, like, I would re-watch, re which in hindsight, not appropriate for a child, the bodyguard constantly. Like constantly, and I was just so, like she was like this otherworldly being, like the fact that that voice could come out of a human was crazy to me. And in, in the um, How Will I Know video, she turns to Aretha Franklin for advice, and that to me is just like a life moment well, of and then inspiration. She, Aretha Franklin, and she, like when she covered Shaka Khan and things, like, yeah. uh, like she, and then I don't know, if that felt like more like paying homage to the women that had influenced her. And I think that's a nice way to do it rather than pretending that you came out, you just right. popped out of like a science, science lab and you're the only one that's ever done it. Like everyone has been inspired by something and it's nice to, but yeah, I still can't. Um, my old neighbor banged on the wall once when I was trying to do, um, was it Run To You that's got all of the key changes? <sighs> I didn't really get there and they were not <laughs> enjoying it. And I was like, shut up. It's like three o'clock on a Friday. Let me try. What about for you? She's Charlie? extraordinary. I mean, I grew up with my mum, my mum's record collection too. I grew up listening to like Billie Holiday and Nina Simone and Peggy Lee and Sarah Vaughan and like all these greats. I mean, I had no idea how great they were until I got a lot older, but I had a phenomenal music education as a result of my mum, who was also a singer. She sang with a big band called the Squadronaires. Um, but then I, I sort of, well, the hormones arrived and I got really <laughs> angry and I fell madly in love with Susie Sue. I mean, she just blew me away. She blew my, she still blows me away. And Patti Smith and uh, Chrissy Hind and, and Debbie Harry. God bless Debbie. Debbie. Yeah. Debbie forever. Um, I think that we only have time for one more question, but since there are probably a lot of young musicians in the room, is there one piece of advice or one thing that you want to leave them with? Yeah. Do the work. Just do the work. Because forget about the accolades, forget about the applause, forget about the glamour, forget about this, that, and everything. You concentrate on doing your work and it's like putting a penny in a piggy bank over and over and over again. And all of a sudden you'll discover you've, you've saved a fortune. You know, do the work, learn your craft and forget what people think. 
and just be an artist in the world. We, women are not taught to be artists in the world. Men are, or certainly men are comfortable with being artists and exploring and, and, and sharing their great ideas. Women in general, and these are generalizations, are taught that their ideas aren't as good as their male counterparts. And, and I think it's just important for women to dream and create and believe in themselves as artists and the rest will eventually come. And it may be like me, it came really late for me. You know, I was mid thirties. Um, Lauren was much younger. So, I mean, your age has got nothing to do with anything. Women focus on their age so much and it's all a construct. It's all in your own mind. You've got plenty of time. Just do the work. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lauren, do you have anything to add? No, I think like one of the first times that we hung out, that's literally the phrase that Shirley said to me was, you've got time. And I feel like that's the thing that, and I guess I'm 31, I'm not hugely old, but then for a person fronting a pop band, people are like, oh my God, ugh, get her out. <laughs> so, Imagine how I feel. Well, but then I think that that was like really, like I, that stuck with me and I thought about it when I was really badly driving home. I was like, I don't have time for this. But for the other stuff, I was like, yeah, it's interesting to think that because you're taught that your worth is this and that's what you're allowed to be. And yeah, I don't know. I think that rings really true. And just figuring out what your definition of success is because so many people are going to tell you what it looks like and what it is, but it's up to you to decide why you're doing what you're doing and ultimately when, what's enough? What is the definition of enough, I think? So do the work, define your own success and dream big. And your agency is not how you look, even though women are taught that that's your absolute utmost currency, that is not, that is a lie. Your agency is your mind. Hmm. What was that? <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this, honestly. Thank you, Pooja. Thank, Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for coming, you guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Laura.